Good afternoon. Apologies for delays in the vaults and everything else. Um, were you looked after? To the okay, thanks very much. Uh, just just before I open it in public, Judith, we've we agreed that um, we would take your opening statement and maybe a round of questions, and then we go into private session, as we've you know we discussed earlier, and uh, allow us to you know probably more frank discussion then. So. Um, yeah. So, okay, we can ask the question in public session. You, we can the ask the questions come, and... Uh, the answer will come in private session. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll really... No, <laughs> we, we can get the answer in, in public session as well. I'm just conscious that if there's questions that are sensitive... Or, I guess, no, no, I totally understand yeah. that, but we're so, not precluded from asking a no, sensitive no, no, question no, in no, public no, session. No, no, right. no, And uh, I'll leave it up to, you know, i leave it up to Judith and Alan, you know, if, which questions, you know, if, if they feel that's... Yeah straying into an area, you know, they can, it makes sense to do it this way. And if there's anything that you, know, you prefer to answer in private, then we, we'll go into the session. Um, so, I, I, apologies, I'm going to have to go out and speak for 10 minutes at some stage during the session. It's probably going to be the private, and Maureen will be shortly after that. But unfortunately, that's the nature of it. There's quite a few members missing. Uh, apologies again on that. But uh, you're very, very welcome. So. In public session, uh, meeting with Judah Thompson, Commissioner for Victims and Survivors. And before we begin, can I remind members, witnesses, and, and persons in, in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phones? Members are requested to ensure that uh, for the duration of the meeting, their mobile phones will be turned off completely or switched to airplane uh, or safe or flight mode, depending on the device. It, it is not sufficient for members to just put their phones on silent mode as this will maintain the, the level of interference with the broadcasting system. Also, I remind uh, members of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on or criticise or make charge against a person or by the outside the house or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her or it identifiable. By virtue of section 17, subsection 7, uh, uh, subsection 2L of the Ju Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to the Joint Committee. If they are directed by the chairperson to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continue to do so, they are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of their evidence. They are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and they are asked to respect the long-standing parliamentary practice to the fact that they should not comment on or criticise or make charges against a person or body outside the House or an official leader by name or in such a way to make him or, or it identifiable. So again, you're, you're warmly welcome, uh, welcome here, here today, um, and uh, Judith and Alan Brecklin. Thank you. Um, and can I thank the committee for inviting myself and, and Alan as a representative of Victims Forum to address you today. Um, as you'll be aware, I'm sure, the purpose of the Commission is to represent the interests of victims and survivors of the Troubles. Um, and part of my legislative duty, and it's one of the best parts, I think, is that I convene a forum of victims and survivors who help make sure that victims themselves are at the heart of legislation and policy in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. So this is the second time that I've addressed this committee, and I think it's timely, um, both in the context of our policy advice and, and, and suggestions to the Government of Ireland as well in relation to the consultation on dealing with the past, but also in the context of EU exit and on the ongoing implementation of the Peace 4 programme in Northern Ireland. Um, I'd like to start by providing some brief commentary on these important developments, and particularly in relation to legacy-related matters. So, members of this committee, we're very aware <coughs> that the Good Friday Agreement made a commitment to, to remember and care for those who were harmed during the Troubles. And it's my belief that there have been a number of very, very substantial attempts over the years to address the harm that was done, um, but that so far the legislation which we need, and we do need legislation, and we need it on both sides of the border, um, has failed to be agreed, failed to be passed, 
to address the needs of victims and survivors. So the fact is, as we sit today, that bereaved families who wish to access judicial processes, who come from every part of society, from across the United Kingdom, Ireland and beyond, at present, those people are told they must wait decades, if at all, before they can get access to investigations, to justice, to, to information about the death of people they loved and to acknowledgement of the harm they suffered. And this has a growing cost. It has a cost to, to families and to people in terms of their belief that the state they live in cares for what happened to them, in terms of their faith in government and justice organisations, and in terms of the community's faith in justice organisations, particularly, I think, in Northern Ireland. Judicial reviews and legal actions have also got a high financial cost. And the irony is that spending £30 million a year for decades on dealing with legacy in ways that does not work and fighting judicial reviews and actions, actually, it's more expensive to do nothing and to continue as we are than it would be to introduce new mechanisms that would have a better chance of delivering for victims and survivors. So it's almost universally accepted that the current system in Northern Ireland, and I, would, and I would say beyond, is not equipped to address this situation. And it was not designed to do so. And the cost of this failure is evident at many levels. For individuals, families and communities across these islands who were impacted, there is still acute pain and loss. And that is now accompanied by a strong sense that those who are empowered to address their issues have chosen to ignore them for decades. And that is why dealing with the legacy of the past cannot be achieved by measures which fail to fully address the many complex and difficult issues. It is also very clear that in the context of high levels of disillusionment and low levels of trust which exist across different political constituencies in Northern Ireland and in Ireland, then any approach must be balanced. It must be transparent, it must operate within the law and it must be victim-centred. People who have suffered harm have waited too long for effective organisations to address their needs. So in relation to legacy and the current consultation, or the recent consultation, in May 2018 the UK Government published its consultation paper addressing the, law, the legacy of the Northern Ireland's past. And that set out draft legislation for implementing the Historical Investigations Unit, the Oral History Archive, the Independent Commission for Information Retrieval and the Implementation and Reconciliation Group. There were 18,000 responses to that consultation and as we still await the outcome of this consultation, victims and survivors continue to be frustrated by the failure, failure to, deliver, to deliver on those legacy mechanisms. And whilst recognising that these delays have a link to the current political impasse, I would still strongly impress on all our political representatives to agree proposals to deal with the past. People have waited too long. I would now want to reflect on some changes which I believe could make these proposals more victim-centred and inclusive, but the need, in spite of anything one might say about the current proposals, and they can be improved and should be improved, the need to find a new way forward is unarguable. There is really no good case for continuing to deal with these matters in the way they are currently dealt with and not dealt with. So in January 2019, I offered this advice to the UK Government um, and it set out the Commission's views on the basis of extensive consultation in relation to those four proposals. But for the first time, my policy advice paper also provides comments for consideration by the Irish Government on how to ensure that the needs of victims and survivors are met in the Republic of Ireland. When talking to people affected by the conflict across the United Kingdom and Ireland, it is clear that their experience and needs are very much the same. I believe that these needs should be addressed in an inclusive way and that this means that choices and options which are open to those who live in Northern Ireland should also be open to those who live elsewhere. And that is why, for the first time, I have shared my advice and made proposals to the Government of Ireland. 
The recommendations in my policy advice have been made after extensive engagement with my Victims and Survivors Forum, with individual victims and survivors, strategic partners, elective representatives, policy makers and organisations funded to deliver services, as well as wider civic society. This has taken place across the United Kingdom and across the Republic of Ireland. And the advice I am giving to both governments also is guided by five key principles agreed by the Victims and Survivors Forum. First, co-design and collaboration. If you're going to do something to address the needs of people who have been harmed, you must do it in a spirit of co-design with those people. So, for example, I have recommended that a Victims and Survivors Steering Group be part of how mechanisms to investigate and give information to families are given. And in every part of these proposals, I have suggested greater engagement of victims and survivors in the design. There must be victim-centred and victim-led. This means that the needs, interests, views and wishes of individual victims and survivors takes, takes priority. So, for example, in relation to each of these institutions, I have talked about the need for advocacy and support to enable people to make the choices that are right for them, to enable them to be supported as they go through and to be advocated for. Um, any proposals as well? The third principle I look for is inclusivity. There are many people who have been excluded from the scope of these proposals, and that does include people who lost people they loved outside of Northern Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, across the UK and elsewhere. There is a sense of isolation and inequality felt by those victims, which often they experience a low level of access to, to support and a lower access to justice in some cases than those elsewhere. It is absolutely critical that whatever we do is done in a way which is independent and impartial. Trust is paramount and it is at a very low level for victims and survivors for very understandable reasons. And that is true across the UK and for those people I've spoken to in the Republic of Ireland. So, for example, on the part of both governments, there are concerns that some matters may be redacted on the basis of national security. And for both governments, there is a real need to make sure that any institutions, therefore, are as transparent as they can be, as robust in terms of having appeal mechanisms against redaction, and that families are given the absolute maximum explanation and access to information and can see that that is happening. And that, 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 that matters wherever people live and wherever the bereavement took place. And all mechanisms must be fit for purpose. So, for example, time frames and funding has to be realistic. There is no point doing things and then not funding them properly. We've had decades of experience of that. It creates disillusionment and distrust. In relation to more general issues in addressing legacy, in the NIO consultation, the Secretary of State has clearly detailed that they must be first and foremost meet the needs of victim survivors, that they must seek to promote reconciliation, and they must reflect broad political consensus. And I would welcome those broad principles. However, whilst I'm of the view that these proposals currently are the best opportunity we have, there are significant changes that need to make, be made to address the principles that I've given. The purpose of historical investigations should not be defined narrowly in terms of the no numbers of prosecutions. That is not really primarily in the end what these investigations need to deliver. What, is mass what matters to people is evident from previous and ongoing investigations that new information and evidence can be uncovered and that families who want answers can be better served than they have been even if the evidence is likely in many cases to be insufficient to secure a conviction. The critical issue for many families and communities as well are access to information about the circumstances leading to the death of people they loved and acknowledgement of the harm that has been done to them. I have sought in my advice to draw out what the implications of this should be, what this focus on families should look like for the objectives, the structure, the staffing and the processes of historical investigations. This is not a normal investigation. It is not just about getting convictions, and it is worth doing, even if convictions are going to be very few and far between. 
It's often pointed out that different people have different wishes and needs, and therefore it is right that the proposed package of measures offers choices and options to individuals and families. But, however, these choices and options must be accompanied by support and information so people can make the decisions that are right for them. The people who want information can be given the best opportunity they have. But at the same time, those who really don't want information, and they are, there are many, there are some in every family, that they aren't routinely delivered with packages of information that they actually don't want. That there is an intelligent and informed way of communicating with families. Advocacy services are critical for people when they engage with legacy institutions. And my recommendations seek to ensure that all of these institutions build in links to what currently exists in the way of advocacy and enhancement of that to meet new demands. There are 47 recommendations and I'm not proposing to go right through those, but I think there are some broad areas with specific reference to the Government of Ireland. In relation to historical investigations, I've requested that the Irish Government establish a mechanism whereby troubles related deaths which happened in the Republic are investigated. Now, I know the scope of the current proposals is only deaths that occur in Northern Ireland, but I've talked to people who lost people they loved within this, this country, within this nation, and they feel just the same. And I think there should never be a two-tier approach to this. You can't have a hierarchy based on location in terms of how people access truth and justice. So it is my strong submission that there needs to be a new mechanism here as well to investigate outstanding, outstanding troubles related deaths here. I've also heard from bereaved families in Ireland across the UK whose access to both civil and criminal justice processes is dependent on the close collaboration between justice organisations in different jurisdictions. I welcome the development of legislation by the Irish Government to facilitate exchange of information for legacy inquests. I believe that new organisations will need to work very effectively sharing information across jurisdictions if they're going to build trust, if they're going to deliver what can be delivered to victims and survivors. And for both governments, there are issues regarding information regarded as sensitive in relation to national security. And for both governments, there is a need to establish fully transparent and accountable processes for determining what information can be withheld or should be withheld on those grounds. Victims and survivors across the UK and Ireland, for very understandable reasons, feel that both governments could use redaction on the grounds of national security as a cloak behind which to hide unpalatable facts. And whether that perception is accurate or whether it is not, it is entirely understandable if there is not as transparent a process as achievable. In relation to the Independent Commission for Information Retrieval, which is based on the treaty between the UK and Irish governments and is accessible to people across both jurisdictions, I've recommended that this should have a victims and survivors steering group in the same way as I have recommended for the historical investigations process. It's just as, as important that there is an intelligent, informed approach based on consultation with victims and survivors about how this institution engages with families, how it seeks to inform its, its deliverables on the basis of what families want. Um, it's very, very important that, um, that in deciding what questions should be asked, I mean, information retrieval is let, led by the wishes of victims and survivors. Anything given through an information retrieval process can actually be structured in individual cases around the questions families have to ask. So engaging with families in an inclusive way and basing the work of that institution on families' wishes is the best way for it to deliver what it can deliver. I've also recommended that to be a proactive outreach strategy, to be inclusive, people have to know you exist. If information retrieval is something that many people don't know exists, then they can't use it. So inclusivity means outreach and communication. Um, and I've recommended that an appeals process similar to that for the Historical Investigation Unit should be put in place if there is any decision to redact information on national security grounds. I recognise that the danger of information leaking between information retrieval and investigations is a real danger which must be removed. At the same time, the obvious answer of sequencing one than the other 
isn't necessarily a very victim-friendly answer. There will be people and families who may already feel they've got as much as they can get for an investigative process and may want to move forward into information retrieval and telling them they have another decade to wait may be time that they don't have. So I think it's really important that in seeking to solve those design problems, there is extensive consultation with victims and survivors and maybe even consideration of giving some ability to families to choose the route they go down um, when time may be short. And another key issue to be addressed, particularly in relation to information retrieval, is the impact of incomplete or incorrect information. I've met and talked to people who've been given information which has then turned not to be correct, and that's worse than being given nothing. In relation to the oral history archive, which is an incredibly important proposal for something which can capture narratives and grow understanding in a way which really can help build reconciliation, as well as giving people the right to have their experiences acknowledged and heard and recorded. So it's really important that it's done in an inclusive way. And the same points about it can't be something that sits in a building somewhere. It must be based on outreach. It can't be inclusive unless it's communicated properly and contributed to in a bottom-up way by different communities. It's also really important that nobody thinks they're excluded from it by having signed the Official Secrets Act, for example. So those things need to be dealt with to do that in an inclusive way. Again, and this is about growing reconciliation. So something that captures narratives in a way that grows understanding is incredibly important to that. And finally, the implementation and reconciliation group. The proposals, the legislative proposals are incredibly thin on this. And yet the, the basic idea of it, what's at the heart of the, 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 the mechanism, is probably the most important of all. If it's to be about acknowledgement, about really capturing what comes out of the other processes in a way that helps people move on, then it's got to be independent of political interference. And the way it's proposed at the moment, which is almost a kind of de haunt process, where people can be put elected onto it at the proposal of a political party and withdrawn by a political party without any reason given, really won't grow its ability to deliver um, a composite independent narrative based on the information coming into it. So we think for it to achieve its purpose, it's really important that there are clear criteria for the nomination of an individual to that group, that actually there are equally clear bases on which someone can be removed from it, and that its purpose in terms of giving acknowledgement to those who suffered and, and that can be on an individual or in a much more kind of societal level. It needs to be really more strongly built into the way it's put together. There are other issues to consider, which I think probably in the interest of time I'm not going to go into in detail now. But um, in relation to accessing services here in Ireland and in other parts of the UK and Great Britain, outside Northern Ireland, it is really welcome that we have funding under Peace 4 which is now starting to deliver health and well-being services to people who haven't had it before. But if we're going to properly deal with people's needs, and if we're going to do that in the context of properly uh, dealing with difficult issues in the past, then there is going to be a growing need for a while for advocacy, for support, and for health and well-being and mental health services. In relation to um, mental health particularly, the growth of the regional trauma network is incredibly important. It's something that's been very slow because of the difficulty of getting policy progressed um, and funding that are given in the current absence of an assembly in Northern Ireland. But it is beginning to, to, to be developed. It will be operational within the next year. And it's needed as much in Ireland as it is in Northern Ireland and particularly in relation to these current proposals. So I would strongly suggest that this committee looks at how health in the north and in Ireland can work together on this really critically important area of mental health and trauma that's related to the troubles. 
given the scale and complexity of the mental health legacy of the Troubles, it's really important that people have access to high quality services and mental health services which are nuanced to an understanding of troubles related trauma. It's also finally and I think more above all important to remember that the aim of le addressing legacy must be to build a better future. At a civic and a political level there continues to be a war of words about the harm inflicted on different individuals and different communities during the troubles and this in itself is often to the detriment of those who suffered. So my recommendations seek to ensure that the combined impact of this package is to offer what is achievable in terms of truth, justice, acknowledgement and reparation to people who were harmed and to do this in a way that is victim-centred and respectful and inclusive of all those who suffered. The proposed mechanisms are designed to address the outstanding impact of the conflict on the people, communities and institutions of Northern Ireland and other parts of the UK and in Ireland. It's a difficult process which is uncomfortable for all, but it needs to be uncomfortable to all to deliver the outcomes which have been sought. And without those difficult conversations, I believe civil service in Northern Ireland will continue to be anchored to a trauma and division which the Troubles wrought. 21 years after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, the broad shape of these measures seems to me what we've come back to time and time again. And I believe the broad shape of these measures is the best chance we have of dealing with the outstanding unfinished business. And I think that although these proposals can be improved and do require some changes, they are still a basis on which we can improve the well-being of victims and survivors and build a better and more rec reconciled society for all. And thank you for your time. Very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I should be here for most of it because the chair has to go before me. Listening to you and reading the policy paper, my immediate reaction is, if only, you were the Minister of Justice for Britain, Northern Ireland and the Republic. Because, I mean, what you're saying there is just so practical, common sense, and it's what we hear from the victims. And in my case, it's Justice for the Forgotten. I chair the group here as Sean chaired before me. And, you know, what you're saying, it's just so true to their story, their experience, and what they've been looking for. I mean, 21 years since the Good Friday Agreement, they're waiting 45 years now, this year, 46. No, it's just incredible. So reading through it, the things that, that really struck me were um, that in the policy, period, it's paramount that information is not seen to be withheld by any government or institution. And we know the blocks from the British government on that information, even refusing to hand it to an independent international judicial figure. Um, the other one, an entitlement to justice regardless of where the death happened. And there is a feeling that the trouble-related deaths that occurred in the Republic are not seen to be as important or on the same parity as those that occurred in Northern Ireland. The UK and Irish governments that they to provide necessary resources to allow all conflict-related deaths to be fully investigated. I mean, that's what the families and the victims have been looking for. So if I could ask you, We've had questions here with our ministers and meetings on a HIU in the Republic, and they always say, no, it's not part of the agreement, whatever. Can you see that, that happening? And wh wherever you want to answer that, that, that would be, be the first one, so that there is that, 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 that parity. The second one is about the amnesties, because we know there's different views as to whether we draw a line under everything, we, just, we go for information retrieval, and we don't look for anything else. And how do you balance um, those, those two? And the other one then is, it's about, it's, I suppose it's about the cost of it, because a lot of what you're saying, there are a lot of costs that are going to be involved in it. And are you confident that that can be met? And finally, again, one is, you've had discussions with our government, um, if you can reply how confident you are that they are taking your recommendations seriously and equally other authorities. Thanks, Chair. I think if it's okay with Alan, I'd like Alan to take the first question around um, 
providing something like the Historical Investigations Unit in Ireland. Um, I'd like to maybe talk about um, amnesty and statute of limitations, uh, and a little bit about cost as well. Um, and I guess we've both had conversations with, with your government, so we can maybe both talk about that. But, um, <clears throat> Maureen, you know my feelings on, on whether there should be a HIU or some sort of a HIU type process south of the border. Um, I attend the same meetings that you've made reference to. Um, yeah, I believe, and, and we have all in the Victims Forum, whenever we've been having discussions around dealing with the past, was the point that we have all made is that everyone should be treated equally. It doesn't matter where the harm happened. It doesn't matter who inflicted the harm. I think that's what's most important. Um, as the proposals currently stand, anyone who was bereaved or injured south of the border or anyone who was bereaved or injured in Britain um, doesn't avail of a similar it doesn't avail of a similar package in relation to investigations so we felt all along within the victims and survivors forum and that's the information that we passed on up to to, to judith that um that has to be addressed and obviously it's good to see it in in, in judith's proposals here um, i think the point about it is is that if it's not done it creates a hierarchy of victims um, and i think probably the ask from ourselves here today is whatever it, uh, influence this committee can have on the Department of Justice, the Department of the Taoiseach, to sort of say, look, you have to put in place something here south of the border um, that, that is on a parallel with the HIU in the north. Um, we recently met with the, the Garda Commissioner, and his point basically was that this is government policy. So the only people who can change that are the government and therefore whatever can be done from, from within this committee and, and whatever other committees there are, um, I think that would be important. Thank you. In relation to the issue of an amnesty, it doesn't matter whether I'm talking to people in Ireland, in the United Kingdom, in other parts of Great Britain, I don't meet victims and survivors who want there to be an amnesty. Not for the most part. I meet many, many people who say prosecutions aren't that important for me. But that's different from saying there should be no attempt to uncover the truth of what happened. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking to soldiers' families. Soldiers were often killed. Whether you're talking to people who died at the hands of the army none of those people want to be told that the way to draw a line under this is to bury it that's what they've been told already and it just feels like a lack of acknowledgement that what happened mattered i think the point is that in order to move on in order to draw that line there does need to be you know a giving of information to those who want it and acknowledging at a much more civic level the wrongness and the harm that was done. If that's how you draw a line. That's how you move on. And you don't do it by suppressing investigation. And I think everyone in this room will be very familiar with the arguments about the legality of an amnesty. It's very, very clear. It can be legal if it is universal for all parties to conflict and if it is accompanied by an information retrieval process. That's not the conversation I hear happening. What I hear happening is a conversation about whether this person or that person shouldn't be pursued or held accountable. I'm afraid uncomfortable accountability is part of this process. It's not about pillorying individuals who are elderly now, no matter who they are. But it is about saying harm happened. People who are harmed who want information are entitled to it, regardless, actually, of what happens to the person who caused that harm. And at the end of the day, under the law, there should be an investigation, a fair, impartial, competent investigation into somebody's death. That's all people are looking for. The terms of the Good Friday Agreement, as people in this room are very, very aware, still apply. They apply to everyone, including soldiers. No one will do more than two years in prison, even if they were convicted. And I would say the li likelihood of anyone being convicted is pretty low. But the importance is of access to information, of access to acknowledgement, and talk about amnesty is, is, is a distraction from that. 
and just a distraction from moving on. Um, so I, I believe it is not lawful to do in the way it's often proposed, and I don't believe it will meet the needs of victims and survivors or society more general to de deal with the past in a way that does allow people to draw a line and move on. Um, that's, that's my take on the question of amnesties. In terms of costs, yes, it's going to be expensive, but add up what it is costing now to do nothing. Or, well, we're not doing nothing. Certainly in the UK, you know, there are repeated legal actions. There are mounting costs from judicial reviews. We have, finally, funding to properly equip the coroner's courts to deal with a backlog of 50 cases. We have a legacy investigation branch within police in Northern Ireland, which, you know, is neither equipped nor constructed in a way which enables it to have confidence of the public and the courts to do its job, but it's still costing money to run it. And the Criminal Justice Inspectorate did a report in 2013 where they added up what they thought the cost of dealing with the past was now in just Northern Ireland, and they said £30 million a year. Now, that was in 2013. I think those costs have gone up, not down. And we've been spending it for decades. So this shouldn't be about money. But if you're going to talk about money, you add up the cost of what we're doing now and set it against how the money could be better spent. I would argue that we do need to do different things about dealing with the past in terms of justice, as well as spending more on mental health, advocacy and support for victims and survivors. And I think the long-term results of that will be much, much better for people, for families, for victims and survivors, and actually for communities and civic society as well. Um, and in terms of conversations with government, well, we're here and delighted to be here. Um, I do, I mean, in the consultation and our response, we were certainly very helpfully assisted by the Department of Foreign Affairs in setting up events. Um, we worked with Justice for the Forgotten as well to contact people and with Austin Stack and other people connected to him to get people together here. Um, uh, I guess the proof of the pudding will be in, in what is then implemented. There is a need, and I know there is ongoing work on legislation to enable information to be given between jurisdictions on civil matters, but more is needed. There needs to be, as Alan has described, a, a counterpart to this investigative unit working here. I've had the same conversation with families in Birmingham. There needs to be something happening in other parts of the UK as well. People who've been left wanting for decades don't expect the system that has failed to deliver to date to do better for them next time. And why should they? Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you, uh, Commissioner, for your presence. One or two more as well, a second. Um, Michelle is looking to come in. Someone else? Uh, Commissioner, um, and indeed, um, Alan, uh, firstly, it's on days like today that I suppose my belief in politics and progress uh, gets restored because the first thing I want to do and to ask as well is that this report be delivered to each and every one of those victims and survivors because sometimes I find, although this is a live broadcast, that we can be talking to ourselves uh, because that certainly to me would give some faith that some progress has been made because the old adage, justice delayed is justice denied, uh, you know, is, is, is so true. Uh, but equally, uh, I've said it here time with a number at this committee with various presentations that if you didn't or weren't told who was making the presentation from either side of the divides, uh, that the problems are the same. And that particularly relates to the legacy issues. So, you know, whether you're talking about the Kingsmill Massacre, Miami Showband, individuals like Terence McKeever, uh, the Ludlow family, uh, the victims as they disappeared, whether it's Captain Robert Nairak or indeed, uh, as I said here again at this committee, my intimate involvement in the issue of the disappearance of Eugene Simmons and Jared Evans, very close to where I live, and Maureen and others can speak for the Dundalk, Monaghan and Dublin bombings. The reality is that 
my engagement with these people and many others who have come in front of this committee is to hear the talk. Uh, they, they want the walk, the walk, and I think what you put together here today for me encapsulates an awful lot put very eloquently uh, that I think members of this committee have said in various utterances, including myself. Um, I think, you know, speaking to governments, um, you've said you speak to them. We've been asked to put whatever uh, pressure we can on justice or others to fulfil this document. Uh, I don't think it's a question of putting pressure. I think it's absolutely incumbent, uh, and it will clear an awful lot of the air of, uh, I suppose, faith in the systems, be it north or south. And I want to commend you uh, for for that. Um, I want to particularly refer to you know, your your issue of legacy, where we talk about justice and truth and particularly the aspect of amnesty, which I was taken with there in the last few minutes. Uh, my experience, and certainly uh, it's not necessarily the same as what you have said, uh, is that people just want to have closure. And ultimately, whether that closure is looking for uh, a, uh, a, you know, a court case and a conviction, but in the main, I have certainly found all people want is the truth and to relive their lives. Uh, invariably, the mental health, and you referred to it, or the trauma that exists in many of the instances that I've taken, be the individual or larger numbers, is just uh, it's beyond belief that people are still suffering after this period in time. We all grieve, but not uh, when we don't know why somebody uh, suffered. And um, I sort of become slightly emotional about it because, again, having lived the border and seen the, the trauma on both sides, I don't care who these people are, they're entitled to a conclusion. And I, I would like, and I suppose I'm making a statement more than a question, but I would like you, you've issued a report here that I said needs to be properly circulated, but equally when, and I spent 25 years on local authority and uh, coming on four years, uh, hopefully, in this uh, chamber, we have been promised, we have been promised, we have been promised. The day for promises is over from both sides, and I'm asking you, how can we collectively get people to realise that this, is prob this legacy issue is probably the most impacting difficulty in terms of bringing about closure to what has gone on on this island for far too long, because you're talking to us, we're talking to the department, we're meeting people, and yet there doesn't seem to be any joined up thinking we can blame uh, either side, but ultimately administration, uh, be it from a southern perspective, a northern perspective, or indeed from a, a, a British perspective, uh, needs to put its foot on the accelerator and, and bring closure, uh, be it for good or bad, for these victims. And I, I, I want to conclude and say that it's, it's, it can't just be this sound bite. I am meeting people day and daily week and weekly. No later than last Friday, I mentioned the Ludlow family, I mentioned other families here, who are saying all we're doing here is talking. It's action that we need. Thank you, Chair. So before I bring in Michelle, I might just ask you, Declan, would you like, as Vice Chair, would you like to... Okay, okay, Michelle. Gourmet, good Francis. Um, Judith and Alan, you're very welcome. Alan, if I walked past you out there and didn't speak, I apologise. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you're, you're both very welcome to the committee here today, and um, thanks for your opening remarks. Um, <coughs> there's there's a, lo a lot in here, and I suppose maybe the first thing, given that we're here, is that you've talked about um, 
meeting representatives of the government and the Department of Foreign Affairs. Have you met with the Taoiseach or, or Minister Coveney yet? Because if the policy is going to change, it's, it's people like that are going to have to change it. So I'm wondering at what level have you met with um, people within the government here? Because I do think it's important that, um, that they're bought into the, the process. And I agree with both Maureen and Declan. There's a lot of common sense in what you've said already. Um, and certainly we would appreciate that change in policy. I know there's victims um, right across these islands and survivors. There's, and while the Dublin and Monaghan bombings understandably get a lot of attention, there were bombings in Gavin as well and families bereaved and children who died as a result of that. And I'm not, you know, I, the pain of those families is the exact same that of Jonathan Parry. So, you know, anybody who's lost a loved one knows what it feels like to be a victim. And to that end, is there any progress on a definition? And um, then <coughs> the the recent rev relev relev revelations around some of the um, what happened in the north and the impact on victims. Could you maybe talk a wee bit, Judith, or Alan, about about sort of how people are feeling as a result of that? And um, then I suppose finally. Uh, it's interesting what you say about government use and redaction on the grounds of national security, and I think we've long felt held that view. Um, I've been to coroners' courts and to um, inquests where it's clear to be seen that, that that is happening. And when we talk about the cost, the financial cost of inquests, they wouldn't be as expensive if the British government didn't spend as much money trying to keep the truth from the families. So we recently had, after over 25 years, we recently had the case of the Malins finally getting to inquest stage and the coroner basically said that no evidence of collusion was found but he in, in his opening remarks described the litany of attempts that were made to either destroy that evidence or to hide it. So while no evidence was found understandably because it was all got rid of. So there was a family who came through the inquest after decades of waiting only to feel probably worse than they did before they went into it. So there's an awful lot of pain and hurt out there. I recognise that. And you know, we've 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 we all been through the conflict. I was diagnosed with PTSD in 2013 as a result of it. So there's a lot of damaged people out there who, who really do need and I'm glad that mental health featured so heavily in the in the report, Judith. We have we have to look at the wider societal issues, the impact that we have both on prescribed drugs, on um, or suicide rates and all of that. So there is still an awful lot of hurt, and if it's not tackled and dealt with properly, then that hurt will continue to be generational, and that pain will be felt for years to come. So thanks a million for coming and for giving us your time here today. Um, <coughs> I think just on, on your, your last point there, Michelle, transitional, transgenerational trauma is something that is is starting to get um, a degree of traction insofar as people are actually acknowledging that it's happening now um, traumatic events that happened within families haven't been talked about for years then suddenly a grandparent dies and it all comes back to people and they have that opportunity to talk where they hadn't talked before um, so I think we have to be very cognizant of what's actually happening there. Um, I think, you know, we hear often that um, in relation to the likes of mental health and the health budget for, for the North, that, um, you know, it has to be in line with health budgets within the other parts of the UK. And that takes away from the fact that we actually went through 25 years to 30 years of a conflict. Um, you can call it a conflict, you can call it the troubles, you know, to me it doesn't matter what you call it. At the end of the day, it was an abnormal way of living for 25 to 30 years. Therefore, that has to have a knock-on effect. And we have to acknowledge that knock-on effect. And whether that's putting money into the regional trauma network, which, which I think is the best way of moving it forward, and, and we've had discussions with the people who are doing that. Sorry, when I say we, I meant within the Victims Forum. Um, so from that perspective, that has to be dealt with. In relation to um, getting the governments involved, I think, un unfortunately, you're right, Declan, a lot of people play lip service to these issues and, and that's not good enough because it's actually something that has impacted massively on people's lives, whether they're 
living south of the border, whether they live north of the border, or as I said earlier, whether they live in, in, in Great Britain. The point about it is, is that it's not about money. It shouldn't be about money. If, if money needs to be found to build a, a nuclear power station, it can be found. If it needs to be found to fight a war somewhere, it can be found. So that's not, for me personally, that's not an issue. Um, I think what's important is that we actually start to deal with this. It's 21 years on, as everyone has said yesterday from the Good Friday Agreement. We don't have many opportunities left. We've gone through a numerous different consultations, going back to Eames Bradley and even before that. There's nothing new in, in, these, con in these proposals, or the Stormont House Agreement proposals, that weren't in Eames Bradley. You know, so we lost 10, 12 years there. Mm -hmm. We have to do it now. People are getting to the age that it's, like, I don't want to make this personal, but my mother is 86 years of age now. Thank God she's in the fullness of her health, but there are other people who aren't. We can't allow this to drag on for another generation. I don't want my children having to deal with what I've dealt with. Um, and I know I'm personalising that, but I'm only personalising it to make that point that, that we shouldn't allow this to, to, to move on to another generation. Just, can I just say, um, it was only when Martina was talking, it just brought home to me, I attended the play in Belfast, and that was so powerful from victims and um, families, and the testimony that you all gave, um, and it's great that it's coming to Dublin, so people here can have a, a chance to see it, but to me, it was the power of drama to tell a story in a way that reports, you know, don't tell. So... Congratulations on your acting. Also. Thank you. Um, just in relation to that, I think you know it is important to actually re notice and realise that there are other ways of telling the story. You know, it doesn't have to be part of the criminal justice system. And, and I, to be honest, found that out by being involved in that process. Um, it was a nerve-wracking process from the start. But the point about it is, is there are other ways of doing things. We shouldn't always look to the criminal justice system because in, in most jurisdictions, the criminal justice system hasn't worked for people and it hasn't worked for people definitely in relation to the troubles of the conflict. So we do need to look at different ways of dealing with our past and, and actually getting a sense of empathy for each other, which I think is sometimes lost and sometimes missing. No, I, I think that I wouldn't want to have much to add to what Alan said. I think just to pick up on um, the, the points around transparency and national security, um, it's not that people are telling me they don't believe there is such a thing as information which could leave people's lives at risk or in danger, security. It's that they need to trust that that is genuinely and only the grounds on which things have been held. And so the answers to that situation have to be about robust appeal and maximum transparency. And that is an issue for both the Government of Ireland and the Government of UK, Great Britain. The impact of victims, the, those recent re revelations, and the definition. Any, any, are we any closer to, to the definition of victims? Uh -huh. At the moment, we have a definition in law, which is the one I operate under, which is an inclusive definition. Now, I understand why that is difficult for some people, and I don't think it's a perfect definition. However, I don't know what a perfect definition would look like, and I don't think a conversation about who should be excluded from consideration of their pain is a healthy one to have as a way of dealing with the past. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I mean, all I can say is a powerful presentation this morning. Um, want to say thank you so much you, you know the work that you're doing is phenomenal work and uh, you know I was up at the with this committee I went up to the Bally Murphy inquest and I have to be honest with you you know what I saw that day was one of the most moving experiences I've ever had you know when when families were were there in the court they were hearing testimonies and the emotion and it really impacted us all, all of the committee that were there that day, it impacted us all so much, you know, and we really got to, you know, and Alan, you spoke about how, you know, a play can tell stories and, you know, but that for me told the reality of the story. And I actually believe that day I saw healing for the families. And I think that's what really moved me, you know, I mean, 
and for the for the next generation you know for the children of those families and the healing for them even though they they weren't some of them weren't even alive when all of that i mean there was brothers and fathers and all of that i mean it was so moving um you know and that's the reality of the situation for the families you know for 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 the for the victims and the survivors um and i and i totally agree with michelle when she says you know er everybody has been impacted in some way and i would have traveled up when you know during the conflict as a child going up going through belfast up to antrim and you know to go from dublin you know in the in the the 60s and 70s and to see the british army there is scary for a child so i mean People had to live in that environment, you know, like that's the reality of living in, in a war environment. So everybody has to be impacted by that, you know, not never, never knowing what the next, you know, thing is going to happen. What is there a bomb going to go off? Is there going to be a shooting? Nobody knew. So you're living in that PTSD, you know, um, environment. So the impact of that, and that does come down through the generations, there's no doubt about it. And we know huge suicides in it. and it has to be a priority actually i mean it really genuinely if only you know the reality was out there from from both governments to, to, that this should be a priority this has to be a priority because you know it will break that that intergenerational trauma and it will save money if you know what i mean it'll save the health service money it'll save the mental health services money if they could just look at this whole issue and how important it is so you know i i don't have you've given a fantastic um presentation today very clear you do great work i mean you know i'd love uh, you know we we want to do our best to support you in i mean we do we're, we're constantly kind of having these discussions um i mean i'm not sure uh, what your reply i think michelle might have asked when you did meet with um, the Taunish, the, I mean, what was the feedback? Um, do you think that it, it might be a priority or what's your thinking on that? I, I've met with the Taunish on a number of occasions and with the Justice Minister, Tony Flanagan. And I think I have a meeting in the diary for next week as well. Um, I believe there is a good understanding of the issues. Um, I believe there is a sense of it being very difficult to move on. Um, I, I need to be more reassured that both governments see this as something which is not only important, but urgent and doable. Yeah. Yeah. Just in the words that Judith has said that this committee uh, call on that action that she has just referred to and that we write as a committee uh, calling for that action and without wanting to come back in separate of that I, I omitted to say that I thought it was it's appropriate when we're dealing with the issue of the victims and survivors that again that this committee in whatever capacity it can would publicly call on those who have not returned the bodies of the disappeared namely uh, I think Seamus Ruddy, Joe Linsky and uh, Robert Nairac that any information and I know that the the, but the Commission for the Retrieval of the Disappeared uh, are doing the very best, but without people coming forward with that information, I think uh, the issue of people not having uh, closure on remains, that it's incumbent on us to uh, publicise the need for people. Uh, and I thought the fact that Brendan made reference to people are ageing, people are going on, there are people out there have information, and it should be provided before it's too late. Was there anything you wanted to say there, Alan? Just, just to go back to your, your comment about being up at the, the Valley Murphy inquest, I think the, the, the big part there is it's acknowledgement. It's acknowledging that something yeah. happened to someone. Um, and unfortunately, not everyone will ever get the inquest or, or, or that level of acknowledgement and that public level of acknowledgement. But that doesn't mean to say that there shouldn't be mechanisms put in place by both governments that attempts to get that level of acknowledgement. And I think that's where the, the, the investigative body has the opportunity of actually looking at it and saying, if a family wants to engage with that sort of a process, well, it's there for them. And everything that can be done <coughs> will be done to ensure that whatever information is available can be given to the families. There are obviously the other mechanisms there as well. And, and the oral history archive is one where, you know, that gives the opportunity for families to tell their story. 
and, and to, to document in some way what actually happened to the individual, who the individual was, and that's what gets lost in an awful lot of all this. You're just another figure, you're just another statistic, and unfortunately we talk about there were 3,700 deaths, but we don't talk about who those individuals were at times, and I think that's what's important out of any of this process is that we remember actually who those individuals were, and it's not just the people who died in, in high-profile incidents or who, who can campaign and, and have the power to campaign. Um, everyone should be remembered. There's lots and lots of lost victims, so to speak, people who are sitting at home very, very quietly, who have, have massive issues, and, and, and they're the people that we need to be reaching out to, and that's what this, this whole process, the Sovereign House Agreement legislation, all of that should be about, reaching out to those individuals who haven't come forward to date, who have unanswered questions, and the only way that can be done is if, if both governments actually are prepared to, to grab the ball by the horns and actually do something positive about it as opposed to just paying lip service, which seems to be where it's at at the minute. Um, we met with the NIO a number of weeks ago and they're still uh, collating their response to the, to the, to the consultation. You know, how, how long does this go on? We need to see some sort of action, um, not just from the, from the British government, but also from the Irish government as well. And just, just, I had one more question there with regard to, um, did you ha have you had any meetings with anybody in the UK or around this, with any of the ministers over there, or has there been any meetings with them? I and the Victims and Survivors Forum have met with the Secretary of State and the previous Secretary of State and the one before that. We've had a number of meetings with the Northern Ireland office. In fairness, we have very regular correspondence with them, but it's seeing action. Yeah. Okay. Um, Declan, did you give a proposal there? We, as a committee, should, uh, through the chair, write to uh, the Minister for Justice and Tisha Gontanish to asking for action. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Is that agreed? Is that agreed? Uh, do, you, do you just want to go into a um, private session? Are there more questions? Is there more questions? No? Okay. Uh, do you want to... No? More questions? Okay. Do you want to uh, make a concluding statement? I, I think probably I said most of what I wanted to say. It would be very welcome to see pressure from both governments, but certainly pressure from this committee is very welcome. Um, we do need action and new institutions on both sides of the border to deal with this. Um, there is everything that people in this room have already described in terms of ongoing pain, impact on this generation, impact on the next. And, and there is a mental health piece that needs to be taken very seriously on both sides of the border to deal with that. Um, and there are justice issues which are very connected to that, which need to be dealt with on both sides of the border. Um, so I thank you for your time and I thank you for your support today. Again, uh, thank you for coming in. I think we, you know, as a committee we've, uh, we've met with various uh, victims groups and they're, they're not all the same. They all, they're all, in, you know, many of, the, many of the people that we've met have been, you know, different individuals. We've, um, they're, they're all still hurting. And there's a commonality in relation to a lot of the people that want, uh, they certainly want answers. Um, some don't want to tie in with, you know, victims groups. Some want to uh, just um, deal with their, their own loss. Um, but I, I think the, the fact that, I think they've all appreciated the fact that, uh, if someone actually goes out and listens to them and, and listens to their story, I think that's you know, a really essential part of it. I know that's part of the oral history that you're, you're proposing. Uh, I really appreciate like, the committee. Really appreciate you your, the time uh, you've spent to come into it. To, to, to apologise again for the, the delays and the, the meeting starting, um, and we will uh, certainly your proposals and your submission here today will. Par, par, uh, be part of um, 
whatever you know the submission that we will actually do in this whole area um, please feel welcome to uh, keep in touch with the, the committee and we feel if you w would like to come in at some stage in the future if there's some development in relation to the, uh, this whole uh, victims area um, or you, you feel that you need greater support or whatever please come please contact the committee and we'll be only delighted to uh, to, to, to welcome you in. So uh, the meeting now stands adjourned. We will next meet on Thursday, the 9th of May. Good morning, Margaret. Thank you.